thank you for li from the list of email he sent you all, and the other from his mother. I, I intended the latter. I intended the latter first. The two overlap to a certain extent. So the one you that you have doesn't speak to the question of marriageability or Evans flaming for consciousness. Uh, just one, one anecdote to supply. We'll pause briefly after my introduction, which is you need to leave after hearing it. <laughs> Evan's mother told me that when Evan was an infant, he would sit in his playpen and engage in a certain activity unbefitting a child of his tender age. Uh, while the rest of us spent those playpen hours trying to figure out, figure a way out, getting our heads stuck between the rails, spitting up, dumping the graduated rings off their stick and throwing them overboard, Evan, his mother told me, sat there and played with words for hours on end. Uh, upon hearing this, I decided that I really didn't need to meet Evan. Uh, this was just a little too much. Uh, what kind of monster must he be by now? As it turns out, Evan, as it turns out, Evan came through his childhood quite well. When I met him for the first time, I, I could understand what he was saying, uh, and I was happy to see that he had also spent some time working on his humor in the playpen, no doubt recognizing it's important for the, uh, it's important for the legend that would always precede him. Uh, as for resume two, Evan has been a professor of law and legal history at Columbia University since he was about 16. Uh, before that, he spoke for justice for Good Marshall, and before that, uh, he spent a few years as a programmer analyst for IBM in San Jose. Uh, Evan is the author of many articles published in very prestigious professional places, read by the prestigiously and professionally few, uh, but has also assumed the role of a committed, or should I say, rabid public intellectual, uh, writing several engaging opinion pieces for the nation. Uh, having such a stake in the free software movement, serving in fact as general counsel for the Free Software Foundation since 1993, Evan has also written several monthly columns for the Geek Mag Linux User Magazine. Uh, I'm going to leave the rest of the details to Evan's website. Uh, the title of tonight's talk uh, is uh, The Dot Communist Manifesto, How Culture Became a, a Property and What We're Going to Do About It. It is conventional to thank people for introductions. <laughs> thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, I noticed that I'm very young in this introduction. That's good because I feel rather old. So to be reminded that I was an infant and such things is good for me, particularly in public. Um, I, I too want to thank Kevin and Paul and all the others who joined together. Bring me here, it makes me worry because I know I'm going to disappoint everybody. Um, those who want me to talk about free software, those who want me to talk about cultural history, those who wish I wouldn't talk at all, they're all going to be at this point this evening. But nonetheless, it's a pleasure and honor to be here in Trump. A specter is haunting multinational capitalism, the specter of free information. All the powers of globalism have entered into an unholy alliance to exercise this specter. Microsoft and Disney, the World Trade Organization, the United States Congress and the European Commission. Where are the advocates of freedom in the new digital society who have not been decried as pirates, anarchists, communists? Have we not seen that many of those hurling the epithets were merely thieves in power, whose talk of intellectual property was merely uh, an attempt to retain unjustifiable privileges in a world irrevocably changing? But it is acknowledged by all the powers of globalism that the movement for freedom is itself a power. And it is high time that the movement for freedom should publish our views in the face of the whole world to meet this nursery tale of the specter of free information with a manifesto of our own. That's where it begins. But I didn't come here to do that. this manifesto. I'll leave that for another day. Of course, the history of all previous societies is the history of class conflict. And, of course, the system of European industrialization, which did, in fact, seem to simplify the class system into a conflict between two great conflicting powers, the proletariat, did happen. 
and out of it, we came to the sad state where we are now. So on the history side, let me take a moment trying to show how we came from the primordial slime to the current mess. <coughs> the book is the first and in many ways the most successful article of mass production in the history of Western culture and represents the first and most successful experiment in the relationship between industrial processes of production and the system of the distribution of information. It is, in many respects, the ideal article of bourgeois culture. Industrially produced, globally available, imperishable, imperialistic, has in its embryonic form, all of the characteristics of the culture in which we now live. But the book isn't the problem. The system of information production that the 19th century knew at the moment when political theory first understood that specter of communism and acknowledged that it was a power, that system of production took for granted, as Marx and Engels said, that the confrontation between new means of industrial production, ever seeking their own refinement, ever overthrowing the social arrangements of the past, would end, in fact, with a perfect division between owners and workers. A division on one side expected to maintain an ever-frozen relationship of power in society, and on the other expected to end in a general expropriated conflict between the two remaining classes in society, that did not happen. Instead, the bourgeois capitalism that Marx thought tended inevitably towards its own destruction found a compromise. The worker became not merely worker, but consumer. Not merely a force to make for ever expanding markets owned by someone else, but a force upon which wishes could be made. Pay the workers five dollars a day, the Fordist theory was, and they will grow up to buy a car, and society will be stable. The inability of the dictatorship of the proletariat to institute actual freedom was a help. When it turned up, it did not sell, at least for very long, for very many. And the system of producing a worker who was also a consumer and who increasingly consumed not merely products, but knowledges of bourgeois production, further qualified the apparently inevitable conflict between a proletarianizing collection of human beings who did labor and an apparently efflorescent bourgeois set of owners. Universal education was a communist idea in the 1860s. The manifesto said, we shall overturn the family private property and have universal education. Of course, that too became part of the bargain for the peace of the bourgeoisie. Universal education produced a worker upon whom new wants could be more easily thought of, and whose production could be trained more thoroughly. To qualify that enormous crisis of recurrent overproduction, which Marx thought was the essence of the problem confronting the bourgeoisie, with workers who could consume what was produced, and whose minds were made open to the creation of wants for things that could be further produced in time to come. But that was only Ford. There was also Edison. From the moment that the grand experiment in going beyond the book to a more general possibility of the mass production of culture came, the whole story took a turn <coughs> more unforeseen than any other of the changes of 19th century political narration. Music, for the whole history of human beings, was an acutely perishable non-commodity, a social process, a thing occurring in a place <coughs> at a time, consumed, if you want to think of it as being consumed, 
where it was made, by people who were indistinctly differentiated as consumers and as makers. After Edison, <coughs> music was a non-perishable commodity that could be moved long distances and that could be, pardon me for using the technical term, alienated from those who made it. No longer a social process, but a thing. No longer a communion, but a transplantation. And that was just music, which was familiar. The moving picture was another whole layer of human experience capable of reunification for the first time. The exploitation of those possibilities, like the exploitation of all other technical possibilities, was, as the thinkers of the earlier 19th century had pointed out, an imperative of the class that owned. But this in itself further encourage the idea of the worker as consumer, as the market for the substantial reabsorption of all that magic surplus that bourgeois industrial capitalism created. So after Edison, all of what was being made was made in a new context. Even the physical things what do we call it now? The merchandising aspect. Was inherently related to the symbolic aspect. And it was in the symbolic aspect of culture's production and distribution, in the ability of the new technology to replace communion with transplantation, that the wanting that absorbed production could occur. And that, too, was only the beginning. It took the new owners of the new symbolic goods, two generations from Edison, to figure out what their business was. It was not, as they first supposed, the making of music or the making of movies. The business of the new owners was the making of celebrities the creation of artificially large human beings, themselves alienated copies of real human beings, with whom fantasy personal relationships could be had. These large, artificially prominent, alienated persons could absorb the wanting of that large number of workers who had been brought by education to want. And in the manipulation of those fantasy personal relationships, the great engine of wealth lay. So that we now find that it no longer actually is clear to us whether these great, large human beings make music or movies. Is Christina Aguilera or Britney Spears a musician, an actress? <laughs> all the roles actually merge because all the fantasies in the relationship are available once the thing that used to be a person is big enough. And that too was on. Because after that, it all went vision. Well, you remember how that goes. All that was substantial melts into air. As indeed it did. It melted into air. And as air, it achieved the apotheosis of bourgeois hope. Property could be made literally out of nothing. Indeed, it is its very nothingness which completes its excellence as property. The fact of its insubstantiality is the key to the untold riches that it represents. So he was right. Bourgeois invention wars on itself, 
destroying the very fabric of what it makes, true. But that was victory, not defeat. That was excellence, not revolution. That was the achievement of an unexpected utopia for owners. Which is where we come in. What happened when it all went digital, when this all that was substantial melted into air? Pardon me for a moment for addressing the economists. It's harsh on everybody else I know, but it must be done. We are entering a phase of human civilization in which, for the first time in the history of human economies, the dominant and most important goods that everything makes and consumes have zero marginal cost. This is the new thing under the sun, the new truth of human political economy. The presence of a dominantly large sector of goods with zero marginal cost in an economy is a thing unknown. Oh, but it can be analyzed in the ordinary way. No problem. The first and easiest thing that one deduces from that magic little graph with the relentlessly downward sloping demand curve on it is that in a perfectly competitive market, the price of goods asymptotically reaches towards marginal cost. A vast amount of ingenuity now goes into denying the obvious influence. The great moral question of the 21st century is this. If all knowledge, all culture, all art, all useful information can be costlessly given to everyone at the same price that it is given to any. If everyone can have everything, everywhere, all the time, why is it ever moral to exclude anyone from anything? If you could make lamb chops in endless number by the mere pressing of a button, there would be no moral argument for hunger ever, anyway. I see no system of moral philosophy generated by the economy of the past that could evolve a principle to explain the moral legitimacy of denial in the presence of infinite profusion. And we are there. And we are there. Not there in esse, everywhere at the moment, but there in posse, everywhere. We are entering into what we ought to call not the internet and not cyberspace, not a thing and not a place, but a social condition, the internet society, a place where everyone is actually or potentially connected to everybody else directly without intermediaries. The simple political economy is the economy of non-scarcity of the goods that matter. Knowledge, culture, wisdom, art, utility. But more follows from that. So let us draw a distinction between two classes of goods that have zero marginal cost. Some goods that have no marginal cost are collaboratively produced and are functional. The archetype is executable computer software programs. Such goods are inherently superior when produced without ownership relations. That's the free software idea. What I have elsewhere called anarchist production. If nobody owns and everybody shares and shares alike, the result is inherently better stuff. With respect to stuff like that, owning it makes the stuff worse. Why? Simply because the forces of production are inherently imbalanced. The people who want to use cannot make. 
the people who want to improve cannot fix. The people who would perceive a problem cannot repair it. The people who would foresee a use cannot foresee all of them. The relation of persons to the means of production is distorted by property relations with respect to the class of goods that have zero marginal cost, are collaboratively made, and are functional. Unless coerced by political power and legal rules, anarchist production inherently outcompetes proprietary production of such goods. We have been doing it now for a little under 20 years, starting from zero. We have 30% of the server market. We should have 100% of the palm top market in the next two years. But that's just fine. In the end, the stuff that works, and that has to work well if people are going to use it, will be produced without property relations because the proprietary producers will have failed to make adequate stuff at competitive prices. That's Mr. Gates' problem. He knows. So do we. But that's only one class of goods. You cannot say about anarchist music that it is better than proprietary. It is not functional. It cannot be tested for betterness or worseness. Meantime, between blue screen of death or whatever. No such measures are available. And no competition in the quality of production can therefore be fully engaged. But with respect to that other class of goods, non-functional goods produced in varying degrees of collaboration with zero marginal cost, anarchist distribution inherently is superior to proprietary distribution. This is what I have elsewhere called the six degrees of separation principle. You remember that the sociologists began in the 1950s to conduct these experiments. You had a randomly selected person, a folder or an envelope addressed to another randomly selected person somewhere else and say, here, give this to somebody you think might be able to get it to somebody who can get it to somebody who can get it to him. And it turns out it's just an empirical test for the depth of the social network that six nodes gets things from here to there in a nation of 180 million people, more or less, all the time. It's a staggering result because we are taught by our systems of production and distribution of goods to assume that the social network is much deeper than it really is, and much less highly interconnected. Remember, that was in the world of the old time. So, when music as a thing in commerce has left the post-production studio and is now ready to be made into the thing for you to have. When it has gone through six hands, it isn't in the story. But if the right to distribute is not bought and sold, if no one is excluded from the power to distribute, if the underlying rule is here, give this to someone you think might like it, when it has passed through six hands, everybody who wants it has it. The proprietary systems for the distribution of culture are the equivalent of the Trabant factories of the German Democratic Republic in the early 1990s. They are profoundly inefficient. They are utterly non-competitive. They are expropriative of the interests of both the creators and the users, and they are going to be destroyed. Not by a class-based revolution of a bunch of narrow schemer and Bolsheviks in a cellar someplace, but by that very property of that educated, semi-bourgeois working class that capitalism created at the end of the 19th century to save itself from the Paris Commune. That collection of people who just wants, and who wants to 
gratify the wants of everybody else, who have the knowledge, the skill, the education, what they are pleased to consider the taste, to acquire, to collect, to distribute, to appreciate, to promote. So what are the class relations of such a system? They are growing more indistinct as that clarity of differentiation between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat vanishes away again. Freeman and slave, lord and serf, guild master and journeyman, bourgeois and proletarian, imperialist and subaltern. Have we not always had these conflicts? Have they not often led to a massive and revolutionary rearrangement of the substance of society? Sure. But now, the very technology that capitalism made undoes alienation, reconnects, communion, rather than transportation becomes the vehicle whereby things are from mind to mind. This is bad news for the owners of everything. Utopia consisted in one very simple principle, which I call letting people have everything they want, but not letting them keep it. But utopia is no place. They are heading no place fast. Sixteen-year-olds move the world's music, <coughs> whether they like it or not, those owners. And that means that musicians can work again. Most musicians, of course, could not work. The artificial creation of the big people meant squashing a lot of small people. If you're going to keep 94% of the gross, in the production of music, you're going to have to have only a few musicians. If you're going to say that the reason that you have a legitimate control over more than 90% of the world's popular music among five companies is that they know which music is good, then the exclusion of the user who cannot afford the music is nothing compared to the exclusion of the unlucky musician who cannot create. The vast inequity the vast inequity isn't just the exclusion from culture. It's the exclusion of potential creators from creation. Now, in our little corner, this geeky little corner of the programmer's universe, we too made it possible for people to do programming again. We too made it possible, and indeed more possible than it had ever been before. Free software is the single greatest corpus of technical education material ever assembled anywhere in the history of the human race. It is possible for anyone, anywhere, to come to the state of the art for nothing, just by reading what everybody else has already done. We are bringing back a condition in which those of us who began working with this technology when it was young found ourselves in. There weren't any rules about what you could work on. Everybody did what he could. And we are there again, because we have shared everything enough that the state of the art in doing almost everything that computers can do is represented by something that anyone can read. Just as once upon a time, the only difference between the musician and the non-musician was who happened to be playing the moment. So ownership is put to a terribly complicated choice. If it could only sustain itself a little while longer, it could sell air at very high prices. <clears throat> its manipulation of wants is just beginning. For the technology that we all now possess allows the owner to reach into the psyche far more deeply than ever before. More comprehensively, more widely.
But the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production. All fast, frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. And they could lose. Not a little bit, not some around the edges, but completely. When we fight the music wars, <coughs> And the RIAA and the recording companies say, but it's piracy. They are lying. They want us to believe that they are concerned that some of the audience will cease to pay. Five percent more will listen for free, or ten percent or fifteen. That's not the problem. That's not the fear. The fear is that a hundred percent of the creators will go elsewhere. That the old systems of distribution will be deserted entirely by the people who make the nothing that is sold, and then they lose not a little, not a lot, but they For the real relations to the means of production now are the creators and the owners. The bourgeoisie, but not the public. All of those minds. Educated to consume, educated to distinguish, educated to care about the little differences. That that overwhelming impulse to industrial creativity threw up. We had to care what brand of deodorant, we had to care what print of paper towel. We had to educate a bunch of people who could be made to believe that what you ought to do in wartime is hug your kids and buy stuff. And so we made those people, and by God, they could create if they only had the means. In the 21st century, does anybody disagree? There will be no such thing as an unpublished poet. In the 20th century, there was damn near no such thing as a published poet. <laughs> My friend Chuck D. says, in five years, there will be 5,000 recording companies and a million recording artists. Nobody makes $10 million a record, and no musician has a day job. Now that, that's fact. That's equity. That's justice. That begins to answer the great moral question of the 21st century. Why should anybody be excluded from anything? <clears throat> Well, what about incentives? If they can't exclude people, then nobody will have the incentive to create. The only reason music gets made is because music is denied to some people for the benefit of others. It's not very convincing, <laughs> is it? But without us, there would be so much music, you wouldn't know what to listen to. We are saving you from the glut of culture. You need us to keep you from reading things. Well, yes, it sounds comical, but I hear it a dozen times a year. I sit on panels with general counsels of AOL, Time Warner, ATT, Microsoft, the division of Gulf and Western. And that's what they say. You need us to tell you what is worthwhile. We educated you to care but not to think. We educated you to have a taste for our goods, not for your own. We created wants in you that only we know intelligently how to satisfy. Alienation is a good, useful word, I said. We get. rides on that. So the first principle has to be that not letting people keep things is legitimate, moral, just, and right. The second principle is there's no other way to do it. 
coercion is the only mechanism that works. After all, how otherwise could musicians get paid, they say, the people that is who make most musicians unemployed? You don't really mean that we would just let people take music and pay what they want for it. But why not? Why not? The distribution systems of bourgeois capitalism were coercive. They depended on force. We don't give you what to eat unless you work. We don't give you what to think unless you pay. We give you no beauty unless you can afford it, more or less. And that maximizes beauty. Non-coercive systems of distribution, compensation, and creation are the work of a pervasively interconnected society. Force doesn't work. It's not merely that coercion is immoral, it's also that it's ineffective. To put every 15-year-old on earth in jail in order to keep music unfree <laughs> is an impracticable activity. They know this. They're smart capitalists. <clears throat> A man widely admired in the hardware industry for another six or eight weeks, named Michael Bell, was asked a few months ago at a public speaking engagement about the DMCA, SSSCA, Hollywood owns everything, don't mess with content, outlook on life. And he said, vindicating his reputation for intelligence, gee, it's not a very good business model, is it suing your customers? <laughs> Right. It's not. So much of what has been going on in the last ten years is an attempt to maintain intermediaries against whom coercion can be directed by owners. Because if the intermediaries really disappeared, there'd be nobody left for the owners to attack but their own customers. And those intermediaries, those propped up places where coercion can be applied, but not face-to-face, -face, not directly to the person you claim to be bringing beauty to, those intermediaries are beginning to pass away. So, how did culture come to be owned? It came to be abstracted. It came to be increasingly first reified and then dissolved. It came to a place where it left behind only the concept of itself as a thing that belongs to me. That great oxymoron, the intellectual property system. What are we going to do about it? We're just going to ignore it. We're just going to ignore it. We're just going to make stuff. We'll get stuff away. If we're let. Because, of course, if the great moral question of the 21st century is why is it moral to exclude anybody from anything, the answer ultimately must be it's moral because we exclude everybody from everything in some fundamental sense. It used to be that in order to get a patent in the United States, you had to have a working model of something. You could bring the patent office a thing and say, here, it works. No more. Quite the contrary. Oh yes, that Thomas Edison, he has more patents than any other individual in the history of the United States. But then he's only running close with Jerome Lemelson, who never made anything. Jerry Lemelson is, to the later 20th century, the perfect example of how everything substantial melts into air. What is an ideal example of the Lemelson patent? 
You know, it would be really good if we could connect the tape recorder to a camera. And then we could have videotape. I have no idea how to do this. But it would be really neat if it could be done. That was a pattern. JBC made one. Lemelson said, hey. But that was then, and this is now. I was reading not long ago a pattern on a method for teaching janitors how to clean the office door. <laughs> uh, you will admit that capitalism has advanced this step. It is not merely one's ability to coerce the poor immigrant into cleaning the office building that we are now celebrating. It's the genius of teaching somebody else's immigrants how to clean office buildings, and don't teach them my way unless you pay me. The idea that only some things can be owned and only some things can we be excluded from, that's a no longer tenable proposition. Now it must either be everything or God help them nothing. And so we watch as bit by bit the philosophy of ownership extends itself beyond the merely intangible to the completely non-existent. And the domain of permissible creativity is restricted more and more to that which nobody else has claimed. By a sovereign act of will, I assert ownership of this idea, don't you dare have it without my permission. But the soil of the 18th century was rich, and beneath the surface of its unfairness slumbered many great ambitions, of which the freedom of speech was one. And thus we got, with a certain 18th century clarity, the idea that Congress should make no law abridging freedom of speech or of the press. Thus we acquired the idea that in a society of justice, error should be met freely with speech that combats it. Thus we came to the notion of a vast marketplace of ideas. A phrase which owners understood one way and creators understood quite another. And so we found ourselves, well, not long ago, last week, last month, last year, the year before, watching as that ambition for the freedom of speech came solidly into conflict with the prerogative of and this, for those of us who worry about war, this is not the great question of the 21st century, but the great question of the next 10 years. How far can ownership control the having of ideas about technology? How far can the ownership of the right to make vast artificial teenagers, belly buttons 12 feet high, <laughs> How far can that activity require of us that what we run and what we write and what we look at and what we carry in our pockets shall be made only for the benefit of expropriating ownership of our people? Not, if we are to have free speech at all, very far. And thus an issue firmly is joined on ground that the bourgeoisie considered its own, its intimately own. The instruments used to destroy the class privilege of antecedent free industrial society are now the instruments that we employ to make a freedom that decomposes the economy of ownership, for which we make no apology. It aspires to three things, liberté, égalité, and fraternity. It aspires to commune. It aspires to equalization. And it aspires to freedom. It isn't simple. 
or else it's embarrassing. It isn't fair, or else it's the only fairness that there is on earth. It will inhibit creativity and innovation, or else it is the only protection that creativity and innovation have in a world, do you remember, where the only freedom is that single, unacceptable freedom of free trade. That unconscionable effort to spread one common commercial culture through the globe. Cheap goods are that which batter down all Chinese walls, remember? Our culture batters down all walls to such a point other cultures begin to batter down walls in their turn. Because of that blind driving force that says, we own this culture, you shall take it. A culture that is not owned has no such need. It does not force itself on tastes not yet desired. It does not seek to make wants where no wants are. It seeks to offer the opportunity to make, to build, to use, to adapt in any way that freedom can conceive. And is in that sense an answer to another great 21st century question. Where does the imperialism of that insubstantial ownership ever stop? So we're going to have a party. We're going to dance in the streets. We're going to make things and we're going to hand them to one another. We're going to say, here, I like this. Maybe you will too. We're going to say, I've done as much with this as I can do. Now it's your turn. Share and share alike. And we are going to be reprobated as criminals. We are going to be stigmatized as pirates, as communists, as anarchists. Those who have property are going to make bribes of it and pay the state to take their side. Broadcasting, might I point out, is unconstitutional. Who made the artificially large Rupert Murdoch? and gave him the power to speak to the millions. A minor sub-subject of that great 21st century question, why is it ever moral to exclude everyone, anyone from anything, should be used where the thing is bandwidth, the ability to communicate. 20th century technology thought that there were limits to the use of bandwidth by sharing. 21st century technology makes the sharing of bandwidth child's play. The infrastructure we grew up with for the distribution of bits recapitulated the infrastructure for the distribution of goods, buying, selling, bottlenecks, gates. Sharing was an inconceivable technical resolution of a problem of apparent scarcity. All gone, all dead, all dead. But politics and the whole of the so-called civilized world depends upon those inequalities of bandwidth. I just watched the man who had the money to buy the bandwidth become mayor of New York City for no other reason than because he could conscript <coughs> bandwidth that was unequally available to those who could pay. And that's a story of no distinctive importance. It is merely every day's news. But for that, too, there ought to be no quarter in the world of the search for justice in the 21st century. 
so we shall be not just pirates, anarchists, and communists, but heathens for such suggestions, for such heterodoxy in the face of the good sense of ownership and the overwhelming need to have. How strange it is. How strange it is now that all those dreams of 19th century political economy have been ruled failures. Gone without a trace, sunk. Nothing left but capitalism and free trade. How strange it is to see that actually this was the moment where it all began to fall apart. How gratifying to see that that great human hope for liberation was not dead but merely slept. There is a specter of it. It is the specter of freedom. 